And welcome to church, everybody. Thank you for being in church this morning. I just thought this morning I would read from Romans 8, starting in verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or the sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Who in this place believes that word? Amen. Listen, that's a name that levels mountains. There's a name that levels mountains Carves out our ways to the sea I've seen its power unravel bands Right in front of me See, there's a faith There's a faith that stands to find Sends Goliath to his knees I've seen his praise unravel shackles Right off my feet Come on, we sing, that's the power That's the power of your name Just a mention makes the way Giants fall and strongholds break
This morning, you are waiting. 
is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only trust in Jesus' name. We sing that again. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest rain, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Come on, lift your arms. Christ
Jesus today. He's worth celebrating. He's our Saviour, our King, our Lord. And today, Jesus, we just come before You. And we ask that You be with us today. Lord, across all our locations, around Australia, around different parts of the world, that Jesus, You be with us today. We need You today. We need Your grace. We need Your love. We need Your peace. We need Your strength. We center our our attention upon You, Jesus. Our hearts are towards You. Our church is in Your hands, Jesus. And we say that humbly today. Amen. Hi, everybody. (laughs) Thank you for being here today and hi to all our locations. And if you're joining us online, uh, it's been a bit of a tough week, I'm sure for all of us. And we're going to talk more about that today. But one of the things that we always do as a church is pray and pray for those in need. And we're gonna do that today. We're gonna continue to pray because there are those amongst us and I know today all of us are feeling some level of pain and sorrow, but there are those who are facing real battles and we wanna take time to remember them as we do in all our services. And so we're gonna pray and at all our locations, we're gonna pray together. And I have some of these prayer requests. Uh, We're praying for Callum who's asked us to pray for a family friend who's suffering from anxiety. We're gonna pray for Carmen, or Carmen has asked us to pray for provision for a home. Elizabeth, we're praying for her, for her loan to be approved. Rhea, praying for healing of her fractured kneecap. Ouch, (laughs) I'm gonna pray with you. Or Rua, I think. Amy is praying for a new job. And we're going to pray with you, Amy. Teresa, believing for her uncle's cancer to be completely healed. And Binu, praying for complete healing for her daughter. Real needs and real people. And we have a God who loves every one of us and is interested in the detail of our lives. And when we pray, we believe in Jesus' name for health, for healing, for miracles, for breakthrough. In every one of these lives and prayer requests I hold in my hand and I know at every location there are people with prayer needs and so wherever you are right now would you reach your hand toward these just to say hey guys we're in agreement together this is not just one person praying and a whole lot of us passively watching this is all of us praying together and so Father we lift every one of these needs to you and Lord Jesus we believe that you will be with these people we pray for those facing physical uh, battles and physical needs and illness and sickness and broken bones or whatever it might be that Lord God, You would heal them. You would be their healer, Lord, whether it's through uh, medical doctors and, and, and medicine or whether it's just by Your divine power, we pray for healing over every one of these people. Lord, we pray for some needing accommodation that You will open doors for them to find a beautiful, safe place to live. Lord, we pray for those needing a job, that there will be a great job for them as they continue to knock and to ask and to to go out and, and Lord, apply, Lord, that they will get a great job. Lord, whatever the need may be, some needing relationships restored, some feeling alone, some feeling anxious, some feeling worried. Lord Jesus, we pray that You would be with them You would be their peace. You would be their strength. We believe for miracle stories of Your power at work in Jesus' Name. And everyone said, Amen. Come on, let's thank God in faith because He is at work answering prayer. And not only do we pray, but we like to praise and celebrate good reports. And here we have Fran praising God that her dad's chemotherapy is working. Well, that is good news. And we're gonna continue to stand with you, Fran, believe for complete healing. 
Susanna is praising God for our venue team. And why wouldn't you, the venue team at every location, all the volunteers, all those who serve, come on, can we give them a proper round of applause because we have so many amazing volunteers who serve so faithfully. And we thank you. Someone else thanking God that their dad joined church online last Sunday and gave his heart to Jesus. Um, how beautiful is that? And it was when we did the, the Holy Spirit worship night last Sunday evening. And obviously, dad was so impacted that gave heart to Jesus. Beautiful. Someone here praising God that her family has been reconciled. Well, that's good news as well. We celebrate those good reports. And Megan is praising God that the son's liver ultrasound confirmed there is no cancer in her son's body. Praise God. And Marcus is praising God for a successful eye cataract surgery. So come on again. We celebrate with all of these people. Such good news. And we wanna to continue to celebrate those kind of good reports. Well, it is so good to have you in church today. And we are always, in every season, a friendly church. And we're so glad you're here. And so why don't you at every one of our locations, just take one moment to turn around, to greet someone, to say hi to someone near you. Give them a hug, give them a high five or a handshake. You can be seated. Gee, Brent Garrett looks stylish today. Must have been dressed by his wife. Um, we have been continuing to support in prayer and uh, other ways through our financial contribution uh, to our church in Ukraine, praying for that situation. Um, and we're gonna continue to pray for Yuri and the whole team and all that is happening. And we've been talking about how our uh, European churches have been able to help and support Ukraine, church there, uh, people leaving uh, refugee status, if you will, leaving Ukraine, particularly uh, women and children. And so we have a short little update. We're hearing from some of our different pastors in Europe about how we are together doing our best uh, to help and support and show, uh, show real practical love to those in need. So we're gonna hear from Andreas and Lena Nielsen who lead our church in Sweden. Hey church, I'm here from Hillsong, Sweden. I just wanna give you a quick update on some of the things that goes on in regards to Ukraine, what we as a church globally do to help out our brothers and sisters in Ukraine and specifically our church. Um, at this point, over 4 million uh, refugees has crossed the borders into Poland and Romania, and um, it's the biggest wave of refugees we've seen in Europe since the Second World War. Uh, they're spreading out across Europe, and I know all of our church across Europe is doing everything we can to help and to house people. Here in Stockholm, uh, the number of refugees that are coming into our city, into our country, is growing rapidly every day. 
We're expected to receive over 150,000 children alone before summer, before June. And the opportunities that we have to serve those families, serve the mothers, serve the kids here is huge. We're working with the government. We're working at all the registration centers. We've seen mothers sleep with kids on the sidewalk to get have a spot for next day to try to get registered. And um, together with government and together with corporate businesses, we have some incredible opportunities opening up for us here in Sweden where we really can make a difference. As we're working every day to support your, uh, the team and our church in Ukraine. Here's what I believe. This is not gonna go away in a couple of weeks. This is gonna go on for a long time. And we as a church, we have to be committed and stay focused to support our brothers and sisters in Ukraine for as long as it takes to uh, help them but also be committed to rebuild the church and rebuild the buildings and rebuild this country. Hey church, I just want you to know, we're doing great things together, trying to serve as best as we can. Today is Wednesday, and I'm standing outside of the Stockholm in Stockholm. Tillsammans med vi här tillsammans med ett team från vår kyrka och det är massvis 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 med människor som åh oh, jag börjar gråta. Som som har flytt från sitt land, som har kommit från trauma, som har kommit från krig, som eh, försöker söka hjälp här i Sverige. Och just nu så är det lite behoven kommer och går exakt vilka, vilka behov vi kan möta. Men vi har varit här idag, vi har varit här och spridit glädje, gett leksaker till barnen, gett lite varm dryck och framförallt har vi kunnat visa människor kärlek. Eh, och jag vill bara säga tack till kyrkan för att ni har varit med och gett för det. Det har kunnat göra att vi har kunnat vara här väldigt snabbt och hjälpa med de mest akuta behoven. Men det här är bara början, så på vilket sätt som du kan vara med, om du vill vara med som volontär får du jättegärna det. Och vara med och be, vara med och be för vår kyrka och be för de här människorna. Jag tror att det här är en väldigt fantastisk möjlighet för oss som kyrka att visa Jesu kärlek för människor. Att visa människor att det finns ett hopp, att det finns ett liv och att det finns en Gud som ser dem och bryr sig om dem. Så tack för att ni är med. How good is that, hey? Just um, for our, our global church family to be doing what they can uh, in practical ways and just seeing, uh, you know, here uh, in Australia, sometimes, you know, you're seeing things uh, on television, you're seeing things through uh, different social media sites, but to hear from our church and our pastors there uh, is, to me, you know, brings it right home. And so we're gonna to continue to support them uh, in whatever way we can. And I just think it's good that we continue to know and hear what is going on uh, and, uh, and just be, be right up to date with that. So let's continue to pray uh, and let's to continue to support them however we can. Uh, right now we're going to receive our tithing offering and I've asked Cass Langton to come and just encourage us today around our giving and uh, at all our locations. Here she comes, give Cass a big welcome. Good morning, good morning church. To be honest, I was hoping that I wouldn't be asked to share around our giving this morning, but I am, and so it is my honour and privilege. Um, if you wanna give this morning, there are ways to give on the screens behind me, or if you're online, I guess there's a screen right here. You know, some mornings, um, Rich and I wake up to a sound. And um, that sound is a sound of sheep bleating. You see, our neighbours have sheep, which means that sometimes we have sheep. They break rank and they come through the fences and Rich is not much of a shepherd. And so he opens up the door and he sends the dog out. And that gets rid of the sheep. Anyway. I tell you that because this week, I have had a text message from somebody asking, how can you stand up on our platform and ask people to give tithes and offerings to our church? And I have thought about that long and hard. And I can tell you with all sincerity that this is why I ask you to give, because the Lord is my shepherd and I shall lack nothing. He is the one who makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters and He refreshes my soul. He does the same for you. He guides you along the right paths, even for His name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil because He is with me. His rod and His staff, they comfort me. 
You, Lord Jesus, you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and your mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And I tell you that to tell you that Jesus said, He is the good shepherd. He lays down His life for His sheep. I give this morning because I know the shepherd. I love the shepherd. I follow the shepherd. I respond in obedience to the shepherd. And so yet again this morning, Rich and I have resolved that we will be found in the house of the Lord. We will give out of everything that we have. We will offer our finances, our hearts, our lives, our families, our homes and everything to Jesus because He is the Good Shepherd and He cares for His sheep. And so I have no worries in inviting you to share everything that you have with the Good Shepherd again this morning because it has always been Him and it will always be Him. And so I'm gonna pray for us. I'm gonna invite you to continue to give your lives to the shepherd. Jesus Christ, you are the good shepherd. You are our king. You are unchangeable. You are safety in storms. You are the one who protects our weathered and weary hearts. And you are the ones that we lift our, you are the one we lift our eyes to. We submit again to your kingdom and your rule and reign. And we say, we trust you to lead us. We bless you, God. Accept our offerings this morning. May they be pleasing and acceptable to you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Love you, church. Thank you, Cass. Well said. Um, we're going to just get into what I want to say now. Um, so, thank you, sir. What's your name? Raphael. Raphael. Hi, Raphael. Where are you from? Switzerland. From Switzerland. You're a good man. Give Raphael a round of applause. <laughs> and thank our worship team as well. Particularly liked that we did a African worship song this morning. You didn't know if you, maybe you did, Waymaker is written, written by a Nigerian. Okay. Guys, thanks for coming to church. Glad you're here. Um, I thought I was over my tears because I've cried a lot of them. And uh, I was actually in the US this week, uh, was to be gathering, which I did have some time with our uh, lead pastors from the USA and Chris Mendes and Lucy were there from uh, Latin America and Damien Bassett from Canada. And then I had to get on a flight to come back early. And, you know, I thought I'll watch that film, I don't know if you've seen it, called King Richard, and, you know, about uh, the father of Serena and Venus Williams, and so I'm already emotional, and then I'm watching that, and I'm just, you know, tears, and I'm thinking, at least this is good, I'm going to get it all out before we get to Sunday, but <laughs> it's not quite out yet, <laughs> and maybe you feel the same. I want to welcome uh, our global churches who are joining us, uh, special welcome to our church in South Africa because my wife, Lucinda, is there. I miss her and my son, Zach. Um, my daughter, one of them is in Argentina with a boyfriend and family and a whole lot of other <laughs> chaperoning. So if you're watching, <laughs> I love you, Felipe. <laughs> I miss our church there, and we love you guys.
across Africa and all our churches around the world. Uh, my other daughter is, also, is in the, the US, um, and I miss her too, Bella. This has be possibly been one of the hardest weeks of my life. Um, there was a statement that I think many of you would have received via email um, regarding Pastor Brian, and I, I'm not going to read that statement uh, right now, but if you haven't read it, I encourage you to do so. Uh, it relates to two incidents involving Pastor Brian where there was a breach of our moral code of conduct and the requirements of leadership for a pastor. There were many rumors uh, and speculation going on, and we felt it was appropriate to share the facts um, firstly, with our staff, uh, and then with all of you, our church family. And uh, so if you haven't, uh, you can view that on our church websites. As I mentioned, this has been very hard, I'm sure, for many of us, uh, for those of us who have had to share this news with others. I didn't expect, uh, I don't expect, actually, to get everything right today. Um, but I'm going to do my best, and I'm kind of reading a little bit scripted because I just put a whole lot of stuff down so that I don't hopefully miss anything. Uh, but to do my best with an honest heart before God uh, and with love for all of you, our church. I want to start by saying we as a leadership of Hillsong Church have repentant hearts in this season. I want to say we are sorry for anyone who has been a victim of any form of uh, harassment. Uh, some of us here or wherever you are listening understand uh, the pain because you've experienced it yourselves. And others of us are doing our best to empathize with you. Uh, where you've been hurt, we pray for healing, uh, strength and courage to move forward in your life. We're a church community uh, that desires that everyone who comes through our doors at any one of our locations will feel safe and we will continue to respond uh, to all that we are facing with love, grace, and truth. As a church community, we are having to deal with some, a whole lot of pain, sorrow, and hurt. And I know this is not easy for any of us there's levels of confusion and disappointment, and all of those emotions. But I pray that we can and we will get through this together. We will continue to pray for Pastor Brian and Bobby and the entire Houston family at this time. And we believe for God's grace, love, peace, and hope to be upon them. I believe for us, that we heal better in community than we do alone. And I want to encourage you that I may not get everything right today, but we're going to be back here next week. <laughs> and hopefully over the time that it takes, uh, you will see the hearts of those who are doing their very best to lead our community and to take us forward in relationship with Jesus, living for him, serving him and serving the world that he has asked us to do that for. Uh, we need each other at this time to show love and kindness, grace and tenderness, to give someone a hug, to offer to pray with each other and for our church. I was speaking with my wife Lucinda this morning and she does send her love to everyone. And we wrote down some things together that we're personally committed to. Firstly, we understand that there are things that do need to change in order for our church um, to be led well and to move forward. And we're not afraid to acknowledge that. Uh, where trust and maybe aspects of transparency have been lost, we'll do our best to rebuild that. Um, Jesus is and always will be at the center of who we are as a church. Always, has been, always will be. In this season, health and healing are our focus. That's what we're committed to. 
Uh, we will seek to honor God in all we do. Uh, we, we're gonna honor God. Um, and there's pressure from every side and voices and people saying this and that, but we've gotta honor God. We love and we will lead his people to the best of our ability. And I say his people, because they're not ours, not mine, not yours, they're, they're us, they're his. We're part of the church of Jesus. Whatever the name is, we're part of the church of Jesus. Amen? We're in his hands. And finally, we will continue to build a beautiful unified church continue to build, because that's what we have been part of, uh, so that her generations can come and stand strong and build together. Someone shared with me today a verse from Job, uh, probably fitting, <laughs> the whole book that <laughs> might be worth reading. Um, just one verse, Job 14, 7, it says, at least there is hope for a tree. Even if it is cut down, it will sprout again and its new shoots will not fail. And I believe that. Through all that is going on, at this time, I've never lost my hope that God is still at work in all of us, that God loves his church, that he loves you and he loves me. And he still has a plan for our church, Hillsong Church, for our lives as we move forward together. And let me remind you, our church, as I said, is built on Jesus, not just on any one person, beyond a board, beyond an eldership. We need these elements, they matter, and we wanna make sure they are done well, that our hope and our trust is in Jesus. We are guided by the Word of God and the Holy Spirit of God, and we will continue to ask God for wisdom and guidance and strength in this season. And I want us to do something right now, and I did not know that Cass was going to refer to Psalm 23 today. And so I would like us to stand together because I had here in this that I want us to go through Psalm 23 together and I wasn't sure what to do with the offering, but I thought, you know what, I'm doing a lot. Someone else can just at least <laughs> do something. And so I called Cass. Thank you, Cass. And then she said, I'm gonna read Psalm 23, and I'm thinking, no, that's mine. <laughs> but I think maybe God's speaking to us. And so as we're standing, let me read this over us together at all our locations. It says, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the darkest valley, I'll fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and your love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Father God, I thank you that you are our shepherd and you are a good shepherd. And Lord, even if we're in a dark valley, we have nothing to fear for you are with us. And we pray you will lead us and guide us through this. We believe together that you are our shepherd, anointing us, preparing us, covering us with your goodness, with your love and with your grace. And we're going to do our best to continue to follow you all the days of our life. Amen. You may be seated. My message is simply titled, Grace, Truth, and a Hope-Filled Future. 
And we're going to do a little bit of a case study today on a guy from the New Testament of the Bible who many of you would be aware of, and familiar with, uh, Simon Peter. And we're just going to look at a few things of how he lived, mistakes he made, his interactions and relationship with Jesus, and what ultimately became of him. And it's his story, but it relates to us. All of us, I believe, can find ourselves somewhere in different moments as we look at the lives of those the, the Bible shares with us. Uh, we can go, yeah, I kind of had a moment like that. What happened? What do, what do I do in that season? Yep, that relates to me. Or right now I'm there, but things ended up there. Well, that's some good news. And so we're going to talk about that and look at some scripture around this today. And I pray today it's going to help us, give us some wisdom and guidance for the way forward. As I mentioned, uh, I was with our uh, USA lead pastors this week, uh, along with guys uh, from Latin America and, and Canada. And we started talking um, as we were having just a little social moment about pets. Because, you know, everyone has a pet story, or most of us do. And, uh, you know, they're always interesting. Everyone's pet story uh, is quite unique. And we heard some very unique pet stories uh, just from the group that we were with, uh, including Sam Collier, who pastors in Atlanta, telling us about his wife always dreamed of owning a mini turtle. I don't know why. There's no condemnation here. That was just her dream. She wanted a pet mini turtle. And so one day, Sam fairly recently found himself in a neighborhood, he says, in Atlanta, which is possibly not the best area and he was kind of moving through there fairly quickly and then he had to stop and there's a, some guys there and he knew just in the back of his mind, his wife had, a, you know, her birthday was coming up and what's he gonna get her? And as he's kind of at these lights, this guy knocks on his window and he's a bit nervous and then the guy lifts a plastic bag up and in it is a mini turtle. <laughs> and he's thinking, as any pastor would, this is a sign from God. <laughs> and so he does a little, you know, winds the window down a little bit, still a bit, you know, nervous of the area he's in. And it's like, what, what are you saying? He goes, yes, and I've got the food for it. And, you know, it's $20 and all of this. And he's like, okay, I'm going to do this. And gives the guy $20, gets the mini turtle. So excited. The food's there. He's comes home, he calls his wife, he says, I've got a birthday gift for you. She's like, okay, I'm going to come home early. She comes home early and, and he kind of presents the mini turtle. She's ecstatic, can't believe it. But then she's thinking, I better work out what to do with it. And so I think a day later, she goes to the pet shop with the mini turtle. She brings it up to the counter and says, look, my husband gave me this turtle and I love it, but I just want to make sure I'm looking after it well. At which point, the people at the counter say, kind of start talking to each other and then others start, they're waving at everyone. And, and then the, she's like, is there a problem? And finally, they say, where did you get this <laughs> turtle? Well, my husband, she's thinking, I don't know if I'm going to get in trouble, but my husband gave it, it was a gift. And she said, well, um, the, the lady at the counter with everyone around said, look, we've had to ban selling mini turtles because they uh, can give, and, and, and his wife, Tony, is pregnant. And uh, she, they said, they, they can carry salmonella and it's not good for pregnant women. 
And so suddenly the mini turtle goes from the greatest gift ever to an evil little thing. And she's like, oh, okay. And so then she's working out what to do with it. And somehow, uh, the, you know, they, they passed it back. And, it, and, it, and I don't know the full end story, but all I know is that the mini turtle is no longer part of Sam and Tony Collier's life. Uh, well done, uh, uh, Sam, for trying to be a good husband. But as all husbands know, we try, we fail sometimes. But we get it another go. Our story I shared was about Rocky the rabbit, the little bunny rabbit. Uh, we, we uh, you know, growing up with our kids, they were, there was various pets. They were excited about different pets. And um, the one they were excited about at this particular time was a rabbit, which was a very cheap rabbit. It literally uh, cost probably in Australian dollars like $5. Uh, we brought the rabbit home. Kids are excited. The problem is there's three kids, there's one rabbit. Everyone wants to hold the rabbit when you first get it to the point where they were fighting over the rabbit. And as they're fighting over the rabbit, uh, between two of them, it's like, I want to hold it. No, I want to hold it. I want to. And literally, they dropped the rabbit. I was there and dropped the rabbit. And they're like, oh, no, oh, no. They're picking out, is it broken? And I, I take the rabbit and I'm feeling all its paws and then I feel one paw and it is broken. And my kids are going, Dad, we need the rabbit. We've got to take it to the vet. I'm thinking we paid $5 for the rabbit. I know this is gonna get way more expensive if I take it to the vet. The vet drives an expensive car, lives in a great neighborhood. It's a $5 rabbit. And my mind is in a dilemma with these little kids looking up at me with their big eyes. Rocky the rabbit looking at me with his big eyes. Everyone looking at me with their big eyes, Dad. I'm going to stop there and continue. Luke 22. Aww. We're going to come back. This is why you have to stay. Luke 22, 55, speaking about Jesus being arrested. Then seizing him, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. This is who we're talking about today. And when some there had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them. Jesus has been arrested. This is when he will ultimately end up being crucified. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked at him closely and said, this man was with him, meaning Jesus, but he denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. A little later, someone else saw him and said, you are also one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. About an hour later, another asserted, certainly this fellow was with him for he's a Galilean. And Peter replied, man, I don't know what you are talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. So somewhere he's in the outer courtyard and from a distance, Jesus turns and looks at Peter. And then Peter remembered the word that the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you'll disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Peter's so upset because Jesus had said that he would do this and he denied that he would ever do it. And now he has done the very thing he said he would never do. The interesting thing to me is, is that Jesus knew he would do this. And the question I have is, why would Jesus choose a guy to be his follower who he knew would fail him? Would you do that? 
I mean, wouldn't you look for the guy who you think is the most dependable? Not the guy who you know is going to fail you at some point. I don't know if I would choose Simon Peter, but Jesus did knowing he would fail him. Simon Peter leaves, weeps bitterly. We don't exactly know where he goes after that, but Jesus continues uh, to to go through this uh, trial, betrayed, and ends up being crucified. And then three days later, as we celebrate around Easter, Jesus rises again. But for Simon Peter, it's been a bit of time. He's so obviously upset, disappointed with himself. He knows he would have received word that Jesus has ended up crucified. Maybe he wonders if there was more he could have done, but he didn't do it. All kinds of emotions would be going through his mind, feeling like a failure, feeling like it's all over. I thought Jesus was going to be the beginning of something brand new, and now it's just all ended. Is that the end? And then we read on in John 21. After Jesus has risen again, after Peter, Simon Peter has betrayed him. It says, after Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It appeared this way, Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Canaan in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realise it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the other side of the boat and you'll find something. And when they did that, they were unable to hold the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, that's John writing about himself. (laughs) He had a high opinion of how well he was loved, which is a good thing. Said to Peter, it is the Lord. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and jumped in the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. And when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Here we see a man who denied Jesus, who failed, who's in pain, who's hurt, who's wondering what is next. He's not alone in his pain because some of the other disciples are with him, connected by their pain, their disappointment, discouragement. They'd followed Jesus and now they didn't know what was gonna happen next because they didn't realise he was going to die. They didn't know this was what was part of the plan. They were trying to work it all out, but they couldn't in their natural minds. So where do you go and what do you do? Go back to what you knew, to your old life. I'm going fishing, is what Peter said, and the others decided to tag along. Not all of them. Some of them went in different directions. It's interesting that they weren't all together. It sounds to me like they were no longer in full unity, that there was maybe some division in the ranks about what should have happened and why it happened and how come it happened and what's going on and... There were different directions. They were no longer united, no longer connected, no longer seeing the deeper, bigger purpose because it seemed to be all over. And Jesus prophesied that. Matthew 26, 31, then Jesus told them, this very night you will all fall away on account of me. For it is written, I'll strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be, hap- will be scattered. And this happens to some of us. Maybe some of us aren't here today because it's too hard, it's too painful, it's too much disappointment. I I don't know what to believe anymore. Some of us have gone fishing because it seemed easier. I secretly hoped maybe I had had close contact with someone with COVID. (laughs) 
because then I could self-isolate and someone else could be here standing before you. And then I also thought, where would I really like to be? And I thought, I'd like to be with a few friends heading up the North Coast to find a quiet place with some decent surf. And then once we're out of the surf, find a bakery <laughs> and enjoy a pie with sauce and a vanilla malt flavored oak milk. Yes, you wanna be there too, don't you? To our global church, you probably don't know what I'm talking about right now, but when you come to Australia, we will introduce, introduce you to the gourmet delights of a meat pie with sauce and a vanilla malt flavored oat milk, and your life will be changed. <laughs> but here I am, and here you are. Thank you for being here. Peter went back to what was comfortable, what he knew and what felt safe, but it was never part of God's future plan for him. It was going back. And in the midst of where he went back to, Jesus went searching for him. That's what I love about this. He went back to what he thought was gonna somehow help the pain and Jesus goes searching for him. In his pain and in his shame of his mistakes, Jesus shows up showing love, grace, and kindness. It's interesting when you compare this passage to the time when the disciples, including Peter, were in a boat in a storm. And Jesus came walking to them and Peter didn't even recognize him again until he got really close. I don't know whether John who's writing and saying, hey, that's Jesus, whether he's just trying to prove that he knew Jesus a little bit better than Simon Peter. And then Jesus called him and Simon Peter's like, when, they're, when the storm's on and Jesus has walked on the water and Simon Peter says, if it's really you, call me. And he, Jesus says, come and he gets out of the boat and he walks on water. This time there's no walking on water. Peter is again in a boat and from a great distance when he's nudged, when he sees the miracle, he's like, this has happened before. This has to be Jesus. Jesus didn't walk to him on the water to prove who he was. He simply stood on the shore, said, throw over your net and see what happens. And Peter sees the fish and Peter remembers what happened last time and he doesn't even care about rowing in. He just jumps in the water and simply swims to Jesus. Full of his own failure and mistakes, sogging wet, comes out of the water, probably not believing this is Jesus and not only is it Jesus, he came looking for me. And he made us breakfast. Peter in his humanity, his fallen, broken human condition, just says, I'm in. Jesus reminds him who he is with a simple statement. Throw your net over the other side. This is who Jesus is. He shows up when we don't deserve it. And he comes to bring us what we need. And it's not because we've earned it or deserved it, but simply because that's what Jesus does. That's what grace is. And I th find it fascinating that Jesus already has fish on the barbecue or the braai for the South Africans. Because they're bringing in fish and Jesus already has fish, as if to say, I know I gave you this, but I already have what I need and what you need. We don't need to walk on water to prove ourselves. We don't need to show anything to Jesus other than the truth of who we are and just get to him. 
His unconditional love and grace is what we all need, especially at times when we feel hurt, ashamed, discouraged, or disappointed. And then after the breakfast, Jesus looks Simon Peter in the eye and asks him some questions that pertain to his future. In John 21, verse 15, it says, when they'd finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, it's interesting that he calls him Simon because he'd renamed him Peter and now he's going back to what he was. So Jesus is referring to him and saying, if that's who you are, do you want me to address you like that? Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt. How quickly things change. Because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Jesus asked three times, do you love me? He asks a really deep question about real love. And what he is saying to Simon Peter is, do you love me more than? What's he saying? What does it mean for us today? Do you love me, Simon, more than power? because you're gonna go on a journey where you become known as like a super apostle. And are you gonna love me more than the accolade and the power and the position that people show you? Are you gonna love me? Are you gonna love me more than prominence? And what others think about you? Because if you associate with me, it's gonna get tough sometimes. Do you love me more than pleasure? Because you're gonna experience some pain. And if you look to pleasure just to numb that pain, you'll end up addicted to things that will even cause greater devastation. But if you truly love me, and you turn to me, I can heal your pain. And I can give you a way through. Do you love me even more than the people and what they want from you and what they say about you. Because let's be honest, Simon Peter, you've already failed me three times when people approached you asking you, are you one of them? And you seem to be more concerned about looking after yourself than real love for me. Do you love yourself or do you love me? Because more than anything and above everything else, Simon Peter, you need to love me. And if you love me, you will feed my sheep. What does that mean? It means loving Jesus is all about serving people. And that's it, Simon Peter. Will you do that? So back to Rocky. <laughs> there I am with a $5 rabbit that has a broken leg or poor and kids looking at me, dad, please. So we get in the car and we go to the vet and that $5 rabbit <laughs> cost me hundreds of dollars. <laughs> and I don't know if you've ever seen a rabbit with a cast on its paw. I've never seen it before. I've never seen it since. The vet was looking at me like, you really want to do this? And then I could see in his eyes, he's thinking, I still have some kids that have to go to high school and university. Your rabbit's loss is my gain. <laughs> and we came home with a rabbit, with a cast, and a pink cast, and the kids looked after it to the best of their ability. 
but it didn't make sense. It was way too costly, but it mattered. And I kind of think that's how Jesus works. It doesn't make sense. It's only worth this, but you would pay that? Really? For me? For us? Because he's saying, that's how much I love you. How will you love me? And the story doesn't stop there. It goes on to Acts chapter 2 and verse 1. And here's Simon Peter with a whole crew. Jesus has done what he had to do and now he has returns to heaven and they're waiting. They're waiting for what's next, but they're waiting in unity. In verse 1, it says of Acts 2, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. In some translations, it says in one accord, there was a sense of unity together. They were patiently waiting. And suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And let's go on to verse 14 because who is the star of the show? Then Peter stood up with the eleven raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And Peter goes on to preach and 3,000 responded to the good news of Jesus on that day. This is Peter at his finest. He's gone from being a fisherman who didn't know what his future could look like to standing before thousands and explaining to them the truth of Jesus. Filled with grace, filled with truth, filled with love, he speaks. And people respond to that guy who denied Jesus who'd made all kinds of mistakes. And let's circle back to Matthew 16, verse 13, as we come to a conclusion. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And then he goes, but what about you? Who do you say I am? And Simon Peter, here he is. This is right before he denies Jesus. This is right before any of the fantastic things that he would do. He just says, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. He would have grown up as a Jewish boy learning about the Messiah, studying the Torah, and standing before him now is the one that he knows everyone in his community has been talking about showing up at some point. And here he is, the Messiah, to say that, to make that assumption that that this, you're him, that everyone, my parents, my grandparents, they've all talked about a Messiah, you're him. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Jesus says to Simon Peter, on this rock, I will build my church. Jesus knows that this guy, Simon Peter, a lot of it more Simon than Peter, will fail and deny him. But he still speaks over him what he can be done, what he can do and be. 
And Jesus does the same for us. I was speaking to a friend recently and he said to me, you know, the biggest challenge for me when I became a Christian was not to accept that Jesus had forgiven his sin, but that Jesus would choose him knowing that even after he had been chosen and accepted Jesus, he would still sin. And not just passively, but sometimes willfully. And yet Jesus still chooses all of us. Even though we make mistakes and we fail, He sees the possibility of who we can be in Him. Our flaws, our failings, our sin, our mistakes. And He says, I'll pick you up and forgive you and heal your heart when you continue to run to me. And we are part of a community of believers who grow together, who build together, who confess our sins and our mistakes together, who dream together, who show love, dignity, grace, and respect for one another because this is what Jesus showed to us. And I believe at this time, we can show both love and honesty, truth and grace. This is a moment to remind people who we truly are as a church and what we believe. If we are to to truly represent Jesus, we need to consider how he showed us to live and how he showed us to respond. And let me remind you, this is Simon Peter's story. It's not Brian Houston's story. It's not Phil Dooley's story. It's not any one of our stories. What I'm teaching us today is Simon Peter's story and how it relates to every one of us. And we find ourselves in these stories in different places today. And I pray that in your heart, you're considering where you are in this story, not just somebody else today, but for you and for me. It's the Word of God teaching us how to live and how to conduct ourselves And whatever the moment we are in right now, I want to remind you that it is not the final moment of our church. Jesus saw in Simon Peter the potential to be one that he would build his church on. It doesn't mean that Simon Peter is the rock that the church is built upon. What it means is that Simon Peter's understanding of who Jesus is, is the rock that the church is built upon. It's not about Simon Peter, it is about Jesus. Because Simon Peter failed and all of us know that in our failures, hey, we don't have what it takes, but if we stay close to Jesus, He can do through all of us what we never imagined. Imagined and through his church, something extraordinary in our cities, in our streets, and across the globe. Ephesians 4.29, I think, is something for us to consider if the worship team can come and join me. Through to verse 32, at this time. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. And this week, where I was with our USA lead pastors is somewhere I've always dreamed of going, Yosemite National Park. I saw my brother and his wife with their beautiful kids, because they live in San Francisco when I first arrived. And I haven't seen them literally since my dad's memorial service, which happened here and the Hills campus, the end of 2019. So it was good to see my brother and then to drive up and hang out with some of our global lead pastors 
We're just great people. We have so many great people. So many great, faithful, good people doing their very best to build a healthy church community that focuses on Jesus all across the earth. But in Yosemite, there are these giant sequoia trees. I think we've got an image coming up. These things are massive. They can grow. I think the highest has been recorded at 94.8 meters. That's over 300 feet. The average height is between 50 and 85 meters. Diameter is around six to eight meters. You can see the size of this compared to the, the guy there. These are huge. They say that the oldest giant sequoia is over 3,000 years, 3,000 years old. I want you to think about that because Jesus said the kingdom, the kingdom of God's like a mustard seed. It starts as a little seed, but it grows into something strong and beautiful and significant that blesses others. You think about these trees and how they have kept growing. And they've grown through every season. And they've grown through fires. And they've grown through storms. And they have grown through all kinds of disaster. And yet they've kept on growing. And they've kept on growing because they were planted. And I pray that we would do the same trusting in Jesus and allowing Him in the midst of fires and, 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 and pain and whatever devastation comes on our, along our way that we would stay strong and do our best to keep healthy, knowing that as we do that over time, we are going to keep growing and maybe one day there'll be a beautiful day just like that one on this photo where the sun bursts through and we go, isn't that just beautiful? I'm so glad I stayed with you, Jesus. I'm so glad I stayed in church community because I've seen what it's done for me. And Jesus, I am sticking with you. And I pray today that would be our heart and that would be our prayer. And together, just like these giant sequoia trees, we will get through this as a church and we'll continue to build what God has called us to build in Jesus' name. Could you stand with me? And I'm gonna ask these guys to lead us in a song of worship. And then we're going to pray together. Please, if you can stick around until we conclude, we would really appreciate that. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop.
That is who He is. That is who He is for each and every one of us. Can we bow our heads and pray? Father God, we thank You that You are with us today in our pain, in our sorrow, maybe for some in our confusion, our discouragement, a sense of loss. Jesus, You are there with us. You know this, You feel what we feel went through even more than maybe we are experiencing right now. So we ask that You be with us as a church community here and across the world, that we would focus on You, Jesus, and we would heal together. We would love and encourage each other. We would offer grace and forgiveness to each other. And we would keep pointing people to You, Jesus. And just with heads bowed and eyes closed, I would like to take an opportunity to pray with people here who say, you know what, Phil, I've been away from God, but I really wanna know Him. Maybe you feel like you failed, like Simon Peter. But Jesus is here waving to you, saying, can we have breakfast? <laughs> can we have lunch? I, I wanna do life with you. I don't believe any of us were designed to do life on our own, but with God and for the great purpose that He's called us to. And that begins with a heart of surrender that says, Jesus, forgive me. Come into my heart. Give me a brand new start. And I believe that's exactly what He will do today. So if you're here at any one of our locations online and you're saying, that's me today, I'd love to pray with you. A simple prayer, but a prayer that begins a brand new relationship between you and your heavenly Father who loves you so dearly and so deeply. If you wanna be included in this prayer, I'm gonna to get to three, I'm gonna to count to three. When I get to three, you just lift your hand wherever you are. I'll see it, acknowledge it. Together we'll pray right where you're at. One, God loves you. Two, have the courage today to say yes to Him. Three, just lift your hand wherever you are. That's you, you're saying that's me today. Thank you, God bless you, wonderful. God bless you, thank you, thank you. You're saying, that's me, beautiful. See hands raised around the auditorium at every one of our locations. If that's you, you lift your hand, say, that's me. If you're online, let us know in the chat. I need to do this today, God. I've been away from you, but I know you're here for me and I want my heart to respond to you today. If that's you, you just lift your hand. We're gonna pray. If you lifted your hand, if you know you need to pray this prayer and make your peace with God today, and you can pray this simple prayer. And as a church family, we're all gonna pray it together. Just repeat this after me. Dear Heavenly Father, Dear Heavenly Father thank, you son, thank you for your Son, Jesus. Thank you for your Son, Jesus. Thank you for everything you've done for me. Thank you for everything you've done for me. And right now, I open my heart and my life, everything I am, and I give it to you. I thank you. From this moment, I am forgiven. I'm a child of God. I'm leaving the past behind and I'm walking forward into my future with Jesus as my Lord, as my Saviour, as my friend. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Yeah, come on, let's congratulate everybody. Well done. And if you prayed that prayer, we believe in that decision so much that we'd love to give you a gift. And it's a New Testament of the Bible. And all the things I was reading from, all the verses I was reading from today are in, in this uh, section of the Bible. And I'd love you to get hold of it because uh, it starts with the story of Jesus. And it'd be so good for you to grab one of these if you prayed that prayer. Or if you don't have a Bible and you need one, then we'll have people at the entra uh, exits, entrances where you may leave and at all our locations with one of these and you can grab one. And hey, we'd love to grab your details just to help you and let you know we're all on this journey together. And we all wanna grow in what it means to know God, to live for Him, to experience the love of Jesus and to keep walking forward 
into all that He has for us. So these are available for you. And if you're online, again, let us know through the chat, hey, I prayed that prayer and we'll send something out to you as well because you made that decision and it's the, the beginning of, a, I believe, an incredible life that you were designed for with Jesus. So can we one more time just congratulate everybody? Well done. And tonight, uh, we're gonna have a worship and prayer night. And I'd love you to come. And we're just gonna take time to worship. We're just gonna take time to be in the presence of Jesus. And we're gonna pray. And we're gonna believe that God will be with us in our church community as we move forward together, amen? And I'd love you to come and be part of that. So I'm gonna say goodbye, <laughs> but I'll be out in the foyer. And, uh, um, anyway. <laughs> Um, okay, <laughs> my wife won't like that, sure. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'll be, I'll be out there with our pastors just to chat to people, just to shake your hand, give you a hug if you need one, um, as will be happening, and I'm sure, at all our locations around the world. And so let's pray, hey, and get on with what God has called us to in building His beautiful church. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank You again for the privilege we have uh, of being part of Your church, the church that You are building, a church I pray that brings glory and honour to You, uh, that is a light for those uh, who may be in darkness, that is a safe place for those who are suffering and may be experiencing pain. And Lord, it is a place that is full of bright hope for tomorrow. Grace and love and peace be upon your people, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, church. Have a great week. Continue to pray for us, and we hope to see you tonight.